All right, guys, welcome back to our teaching in the book of Genesis. Now, the last time we were here in chapter 33, it was the long awaited meeting of Jacob and Esau. While Jacob was anticipating meeting Esau in an undisturbed manner, that is, Esau was coming to him with 400 men, which had unnerved Jacob greatly. But Jacob was expecting to receive Esau in an un. un nerved manner. Nevertheless, God had turned the heart of Esau and Esau met his brother in peace and they both fell upon one another and kissed. And so the meeting between Jacob and Esau went very well. And so Esau with those 400 men offered to accompany Jacob on his way toward Mount Seir. However, Jacob very cunningly and wisely decided not to to stay with Esau. So he spoke in concerning the children and the small animals saying that they were so small that they could not keep up with Esau and his company of men and that Esau should simply go on ahead of them. And Jacob said that he would meet them uh, in Mount Seir. And then Esau offered to allow Jacob, allow him to leave Jacob a small escort and Jacob denied this as well. The idea is those things which were of Esau or the company of Esau, the idea of separation between himself and Esau, that was in the mind and heart of Jacob. So Jacob refused these things as well. He and his brother met in peace and departed in peace. Esau went on his way back to Mount Seir, but Jacob who said he would meet Esau in Mount Seir, went the opposite direction and Jacob went toward the land of Shechem or should we call it the city state of Shechem and there while he was on the outskirts of the city. And that's important as we get ready to go into chapter 34. As he is in the outskirts of the city, Jacob buys a parcel of land for a hundred pieces of money. And then Jacob begins to settle on the outskirts of Shechem. And with that, we move into chapter 34 with Jacob outside of Shechem. Now, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to visit the daughters of the land. When Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Havite, the prince of the land, saw her, he took her and lay with her by force. He was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, And he loved the girl and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get me this young girl for a wife. Now, I want to stop there and comment because there are a lot of things to say. And I don't want to be too dogmatic about it. But there are a lot of things to take notice of in this passage. So now we begin with Dinah the daughter of Leah. And this was Jacob's daughter, of course, that he had by Leah. And we remember that Jacob had two wives as well as two concubines to Bilhah and Zilpah given to him by his wives, Rachel and Leah. But nevertheless, Leah is the daughter of, uh, I'm sorry, Dinah is the daughter of Leah. Okay. And so she goes out to visit the daughters of the land. Now this statement seems, uh, somewhat innocuous at best. It doesn't seem like it's really important, but it is. And it sets the stage for a great havoc that is to happen later on, even in the history of Israel. So let me explain and give you some picture around it. Now, Leah, I'm sorry, Dinah, the daughter, she has come of age and now she wants to go out into Shechem to socialize among the daughters of Shechem, uh, uh, among the Canaanites of the land. And this becomes problematic because God had already determined that Israel should be distinctive. God had already determined that, and and the whole reason behind all of this in their distinctiveness, in their ethnic distinctiveness, social distinctiveness, their religious distinctiveness is so that it would not be polluted with the Canaanites. 
you have to keep in mind as we're working through these studies concerning issues like this. Shechem, the city of Shechem, these people are Canaanites. They are worshipers of idol gods. And not only are they worshipers of idol gods, they oftentimes participate in immoral lifestyle. So not only are they idol worshipers, yes, but their moral lifestyle is significantly different from those of the Israelites. Okay, and also now let's put this together as well. The purpose of God in calling Abraham and using his descendants. So you have to keep those things in mind. God called Abraham. He called him out of the company of humanity and he chose him and his descendants. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob, 12 sons, Israel, the nation of Israel. He chose the nation of Israel to maintain the knowledge of God, the worship of God, so that the Gentiles themselves would come into this knowledge, that, that this would be shown unto them, okay? God did not intend for the Israelites to become incorporated with the Canaanites, to be incorporated with the Gentile world, because in their intermixing, they not only lose their ethnic identity, they lose the purpose by which they were called by God. So the very act of Dinah going out amongst the Gentiles to mix, that's the idea, to socially interact and mix is beginning to endanger the purpose that God has set the Israelites apart for in the first place. So this is no good. He wants to go out and take a look around. But the idea of this innocence, not only because it's going to bring a, a, so much havoc, it's going to end up wreaking so much havoc uh, amongst the Jewish people and their Gentile neighbors, but also because it endangers the purpose of God. And that is for the Jewish people to remain unique and separate, not only in their ethnicity, but because of their sole purpose of being called as a light of the true God and in mingling. And we'll see that even later on, especially as Moses will speak, he'll speak in the law. Once the law will come 400 years later, we will see how God will say concerning the Jewish people and the Canaanites who will be in the land when they come from Egypt, how God will speak through Moses in the law of Moses that the Jewish people are not to intermarry, are not to intermix any of these things with these Gentiles. Why? Because they will ultimately turn their hearts from the true and living God. So what we see here, this begins to take place. And as we work through the text, we'll begin to notice this very idea as we'll see in the proposal of Hamor. Now we're not there yet. And I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm premature, premature in dealing with these facts. But the point that I'm stressing is this social interaction with the Gentile, it is going to become a major problem and a major no, no for the Jewish people losing their distinctiveness. All right. Enough of that being said. So she went out. Her intent was basically to socially interact with the women of this Canaanite city. And she was found by Shechem, who is the prince of the city. Hamor, remember, we seen just earlier in chapter number 33, when Jacob bought the parcel of land, he bargained with Hamor, who is like the king of this city state, therefore making his son Shechem a prince of the city state of Shechem. Okay. And so Shechem sees Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he has this attraction for her and he takes her by force. That literally means he rapes the girl. He literally raped the girl. He took her and raped her. But, and it was an interesting thing that we also see concerning Shechem. Shechem, after he raped Dinah, first he was no doubt physically attracted to the girl. Then after the rape, he became 
deeply attracted to the girl. It's almost like he just simply just fell in love with the girl. And this is different from what we saw. Remember, and that's many years into the future. But for an example, we can see the same thing with Amnon and Tamar. And this was David's son and daughter. When Amnon raped his sister and after Amnon raped his sister, the scripture says he hated her. But this is different with Shechem. Shechem really just fell in love with the girl. And so he went to his father, according to the customs of that time, his father, Hamor, and he asked his father, you can almost see the pleading coming from him, to get, get Dinah as a wife for himself. That is, make the arrangement. The arrangement would be made between the heads of the families with the participation of the brothers, as we will see, and we will come in about that as we get to it. So he goes and says to his father, get her as a wife for me. All right. Five. Now, Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons were with his livestock in the field. So Jacob kept silent until they came in. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem went out to Jacob to speak with him. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it and the men were grieved and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him in marriage. Intermarry with us, give your daughters to us, and take our daughters for yourselves. Thus you shall live with us, and the land shall be open before you. Live and trade in it, and acquire property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, if I find favor in your sight, then I will give whatever you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payment and gift, and I will give according as you say to me, but give me the girl in marriage. Okay, so now the proposal begins. Hamor goes to Jacob to set up some type of a marriage arrangement for the girl. And so as he goes there, in his, uh, 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 he has to give something to Jacob, not only to possibly assuage Jacob's anger. Why? Because Shechem, Hamor's son, has raped Jacob's daughter. So not only simply that, but he also has to make it attractive for Jacob to do such a thing. So now let's look at the particular proposal. And that's basically what we're getting from Hamar. The proposal that Hamar is making to uh, Jacob. So he goes to Jacob and Jacob had heard all about this particular rape thing and his sons were out in the field. And so finally they have come home. And so therefore we see they are going to engage in the uh, bridal practice in this marriage as well. We saw that also, and I'm going to slow it down just a little bit. We saw this also. Remember when, um, when Abraham sent for a son for his wife, uh, for, <laughs> a wife for his son, Isaac, and he sent his servant there. We also saw Laban, who was the brother of Rebecca, very much involved in this marital arrangement deal. Okay. This marital contract. And so we'll see the same thing here. Even though Jacob is the head of the family, the brothers that means Jacob's sons. The, they will also participate in this marriage contractual arrangement that we'll find out that's going on here. So, but nevertheless, let's go to the proposal of Hamor. And so as he gets there, when he came in to speak with him, he offered that they should be come in, intermarry. He offered to intermarry with them. And that is to give their sons unto their daughters. As a matter of fact, let me back it up and start from the top. And so he let him know, he let him know that, all right, you can become a citizen. And that's the point that I need to start right here. All right. Remember when we went at the end of chapter 33 
that Jacob was dwelling, Jacob and his family, Jacob, who is also called Israel. That's going to come uh, a point to be made out here. But Jacob and his family are dwelling outside of the city. They are nomads, which means they are non citizens of Shechem. OK. And the idea of gaining citizenship, it did not come easy. And therefore, it would be of great value to Jacob and his family, his all of his people, his household to have citizens to be able to become citizens there. They could inhabit and live within the within the city and they could trade within the city. So life would become easier. And so he offers Jacob citizens in the city, citizenry <laughs> in the city. But not only does he do that, here is the danger. And notice what I was trying to stress to you guys earlier, the offer of intermarriage, which would not only pollute, but dilute the ethnicity of Israel. They would lose their distinctiveness as a people. And in losing their distinctiveness as a people, they lose their culture. They lose their identity. They lose their purpose. And again, what is the purpose of the Israelite Jewish people called by God to preserve the knowledge and worship of true God so that the other non worshiping nations of the Gentiles would see and come into this knowledge of God. Okay. But if they begin to intermarry, they lose this distinctiveness and they begin to ultimately lose their identity and purpose in the intermarriage. So that is what Hamor is proposing intermarrying. You marry our daughters, we'll marry your daughters. We become one people. And so therefore you have what? The endangerment of God's calling of the Jewish people. The purpose and plan of God is now being endangered because all because, all because Dinah wanted to go and socially interact with these Gentiles, but nevertheless, so this is the proposal that he sets before and you come, you, 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 you become a citizen, you trade and you acquire property. You become one of us. But remember the text has said that the brothers of Dinah's brothers were very angry when they're and rightfully so <laughs> rightfully so, but they were very angry when they found out that Shechem had raped their sisters. So you can imagine as they were sitting there, that was a, there was a boiling inside of them. But when we look at the character of Jacob, or should we say, we look at how Jacob responded to the whole situation. Jacob was a little, he was a little cool and calm. Jacob did not overreact. He did not act overtly in any way. He didn't even really show any anger. Now, I, I, let me interject here. Let me interject here. Notice Dinah is the daughter of Leah, but I suppose, and you have to remember all of that history that we talked about earlier concerning Rachel and Leah, Jacob's feeling towards Leah, Jacob's feeling towards Rachel. But nevertheless, the point that I'm trying to stress is, I imagine that had Dinah been Rachel's daughter, Jacob would have acted a little differently. He would have been a little angrier because of that, because we remember Rachel was his favorite wife and Leah was his least favorite one. But anyway, the point that I'm stressing is, so he goes with this proposal to Jacob and his sons. And then we will begin to see the sons of Jacob now take the leading role in the marital contractual arrangement in the proposal of Hamor, whether or not they're going to simply accept his offer. Okay. Verse number 11, I'm sorry, 13, but Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamor with deceit because he had defiled Dinah's, Dinah, their sister. They said to him, to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you. If you will become like us 
in that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters for ourselves and we will live with you and become, notice again, one people, losing that distinctiveness. But anyway, but if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. Okay, so now the response to Hamor's proposal, and notice again, it is not Jacob who is continuing or establishing this contractual response, but it's his sons. And remember the whole the point concerning the sons is they were angry. And so what did they do? They responded deceitfully, meaning they had ulterior motives in what they were saying. Now we're not going to talk about that until we get there, but they had no intentions of being faithful to this covenant that they were making with Laban. Now, now, let me slow some things down. Even though, and we'll notice here too, we'll see time and again, it said, because Shechem raped their sister. This is a wrong thing to do. You know, of course, I don't have to tell you that. You don't rape anybody you know, by force. You don't do anything like that, okay? But still, whenever one is making a covenant, one should be faithful to the covenant and should be faithful in the making of the covenant. So even though, even though the, uh, the sons of Jacob are justified to be angry and to take some sort of an action, and that's the point that I'm trying to stress here, to take some sort of an action, if you didn't want to engage in this marital arrangement, okay, fine then seek justice in another way. Do not make a false covenant. The scripture is a given against making a false covenant. If you make, if you give your word to do something, one should be faithful in keeping his word and doing that. But here, Jacob's sons are acting deceitfully and they, they, they say, okay, I tell you what we'll do. We'll consent to everything that you said and, and all of these wonderful advantages that you just offered us lowly nomads here in becoming citizens and gaining property and things of that nature and living in your, in your city state. Okay. That sounds all wonderful, but nevertheless, we still can't do it because you are uncircumcised and we find this to be disgraceful to us. Tell you what, if you submit, not only just you, Hamor and Shechem submit to circumcision, but Every male, and see, here's where the conniving is coming in the, on, this, on the part of the sons of Jacob. Every male of your people, all your males submit to circumcision, then we can intermarry with one another and be one people. And once again, I want to emphasize that idea. Notice what's floating here. One people, a people with the Canaanites losing their distinctiveness, losing their identity, and thereby losing their purpose. God's calling them a Jewish people, a light unto the Gentiles, lost because of these things. Okay, I'm not going to rehash that, but that was their response. All right, now let's look at the response of Hamor and his son. Now their words, verse number 18, seemed, a reasonable, seemed reasonable to Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. The young man did not delay to do the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was more respected than all the household of his father. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of, the, of their city and spoke to the men of their city saying, these men are friendly with us. Therefore, let them live in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters in marriage and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to live with us, to become one people. Notice again, you can't miss it. One people that every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock and their property and all their animals be ours? Only let us consent to them and they will live with us. 
all who went out of the gate of the of his city listened to Hamor and to his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Okay, now let's talk about that and allow me to take my time a little bit to talk about this with just a little bit more detail. Okay, now the, now the, the agreement has been made between Jacob and his sons and Hamor and Shechem. But the point is, it involves all the men of Shechem. That is, remember the son said, all the men must be circumcised before we do this intermarriage. Give our daughters to your sons and take your daughters unto us as well. So the circumcision is the primary point. So Hamor has to sell this to the people of his city. Why? Because this whole point of circumcision ain't, ain't appealing because remember you have grown men. And if you understand what circumcision is of the male sexual part, <laughs> especially for a grown man, remember Jewish, Jewish people did that when their babies were eight days old. So to do this, when you're a boy up until manhood would be extremely painful, but so he has to find a way to sell it to them. So what happens? He goes to the gate of the city. What's important about the gate of the city? The gate of the city was the place where the business for the city. This is where public business were do was done. Okay. And not only public business, but any form of judgment was, was uh, rendered or say for instance, there was a signing of some type of a contract agreement. It was done at the gate of the city. The point is that the public would be brought into this whole thing. City business is done there. So all the men are gathered there and then he begins to lay out his points to sell it. Okay. And notice that his point is a lot. He said they are friendly with us. So he says that the tribe of Jacob is a friendly tribe. Then he begins to say the land that we are living in is large enough to sustain us as well as them. And so therefore the land is large enough. And so he says also too, all of these are plus pluses that he's giving him in front of it before he drops the boom. Okay, so, and we want to intermarry with their daughters and allow our daughters to intermarry with them. Okay, plus it's pretty cool with them too. And then he gets to the point and says, but the only way that they'll agree to this is if we become circumcised. Now he just dropped the boom right there to become circumcised and they knew that would definitely be unpleasant. So what does he do? He now deals with the monetary motive. And that's the key to it all in the, in the mind of Hamor. He says, take a look. We all know Jacob and his family, his household, his clan has been living outside of the city. And we all know, remember the whole thing that the Bible has been talking about concerning Jacob, even when it's dealing with Esau. Remember that super big gift that Jacob gave to Esau in coming back into the land? And no doubt his material wealth has steadily been increasing while he is in the land. So one thing that you can see about Jacob, these Israelite people, they are wealthy. And so Hamar deals with that. He said, look, all of their property, the sheep and their goats, if we enter into this agreement, sooner or later, we will acquire the property of these poor slubs of these Israelites. We're going to get all of their property. And so therefore it's going to benefit us in the end. So go ahead. I know the circumcision is just a short term. It's just a short term. What is it? What did, what did we say? No pain, no gain. And so that's basically how Hamor is selling this to the men of Shechem. Let's do the circumcision. It's going to hurt us for a little while, but in the end, we are really going to get rich. But also too, it shows you about the motive of Hamar when he was making the contractual agreement with Jacob and his sons. It was not only for the love of his son. I, I, I forgot to tell you guys, I missed it. It said that Shechem, the son of Hamor, was the most respectful, respected member of the household of Hamor. In other words, 
Shechem being the more respected member because of his presence, it also sold this proposal too. But anyway, the point that I was simply saying was, it shows the heart of Hamor in the first place in this so-called contract with Jacob and his son, that it was not so much trying to get a wife for his son, Hamor all along was looking at acquiring the property of Jacob. Men of the city, listen, they agreed to this proposal to be circumcised. Listen, they were persuaded by Hamor and so they were circumcised. All right, now let's continue after that. Now it came about, verse number 25, on the third day when they were in pain that two of Jacob's sons, Simon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city unawares and killed every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went forth. Jacob's son came upon the slain and looted the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and they captured and looted all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives, which here should be women, even all that was in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and my men being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me and I will be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, should he have treated our sister as a harlot? All right. So it is now the third day after the circumcision of the men of Shechem. And by this time, the soreness has really set in. And therefore, because the soreness is so great in all the males, it has rendered the, it has basically incapacitated them. You can't do nothing but basically just lay around and mourn. <laughs> but anyway, and so what happens? Now we see the two brothers of Dinah, specifically uh, Simon and Levi, and these are the whole brothers. Remember, in other words, when I say the whole brothers, these are the sons of Leah. Remember, Dinah is the daughter of Leah. Simon and Levi are her four brothers. They are also the sons of of Leah. And so we can see them being more angry because it was their sister from their shared father and mother. But nevertheless, they knew that if these men had circumcised themselves, it would be about the third day that they couldn't do put up any kind of resistance. So they walked boldly into the city with a sword in their hand. And that's what the scripture was meaning when it said they spoke deceitfully because they did not intend to intermarry with them in the first place. They were seeking revenge. They were not. And here is the difference. The thing that I want you to see concerning Simon and Levi. They were not simply seeking justice. They were seeking revenge. And the whole idea is, notice what the scriptures kept saying, because she can rape their sister. So what did they do? They walked into the city, went into first the household of the city king, Hamor. And they killed Hamor. They killed Shechem, his son. But they did, and they took Dinah, from the household of Shechem. So we see the idea seems to suggest that when Shechem had raped Dinah, he kept her in the household the whole time. He still had her, even when they were making the negotiations. Dinah was not home. She was at the household of Shechem being kept by force. And so the brothers come and take Dinah back home and they, killed him and they took all of their, their things. They took, took their property and took their wives and took their children, but they didn't stop there. They went, remember, all of the men of the city are circumcised. They went into all of the men of Shechem and killed 
every single one of them. They took their wives, they took all of their children, they took all of their property. They took the property in the city, they took the property in the field, they took everything and went back home. They took that and the, and the excuse that they used that it became a ransom for their daughter, for their sister Dinah. It was a ransom of payment for, for not just simply bridal payment, but in justification for raping Dinah. So they, in a sense, wanted to act as if they held the whole city responsible for this particular thing. Now, after doing this thing, they came home and of course, Jacob discovered exactly, you can't keep that in a box. Uh, he discovered what his two sons had done and Jacob became very angry and disgusted with Simon and Levi. And he used the terminology, you have caused me to stink in the nostrils of my neighbors. And the whole idea is why? He said, because when they find out what you have done, our people will not be acceptable among any of amongst any of these Canaanites and they will set their minds toward revenge and they are going to gather to gather themselves together and attack my clan and the men of my house are so few in number. We won't be able to resist them. And ultimately here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. I will be destroyed. Me and my household will be destroyed. You should not have done this thing. Simon and Levi had a ready answer as the one they've been using the whole time and they threw it back into Jacob's face. Well, he shouldn't have treated our sister like she was a prostitute in the first place then. But now here's the thing that I was trying to make you guys to understand. Even though Jacob was uh, still a little too cool, he was too cool at the rape of his daughter. But nevertheless, this does not in any way, shape, form or fashion justify what Simon and Levi had done. If they had simply gone into the household of Hamor, where there was Hamor, the crooked joke in the first place, and Shechem, the one who had committed the rape and had done this. Okay, fine. That would have been a sense of justice, but they didn't stop there. They went into the men of the city who did not participate in the rape of Dinah. And even if Hamor had given them this uh, uh, divisive plan of trying to acquire Jacob's wealth, that does not excuse to murder these people and to kill these people and take their wives and children and all of that. The sons of Jacob went too far and that was their sin. And what, what will become is this and notice how the, it brought about the anger of their father. But the point that I want to say here is this, not only that, when we get to Genesis chapter 49 and we see Jacob by divine measure, that is the God moving Jacob to bless his sons. Jacob brings up this incident once again concerning Simon and Levi. And Jacob speaks by way of prophetic utterance concerning their anger and says that Simon and Levi will be dispersed within Jacob. Now, what does that all mean? It literally meant that at the time when Israel would come back into the land of promise, that which Moses and Joshua would do in dividing the lands to the sons of Jacob. Remember Jacob had 12 sons and there ended up being 12 tribes. But when the time came for the division of the land to be given to each tribe and remember Simon and Levi were of the 12 sons. So therefore, if you're going to give 12 tribes, they will receive a tribe and a division of land themselves. This is not what happened. And this is not what worked out. They were absorbed into the other tribes for we see that Simon and Levi, Neither one of them were given an inheritance in the promised land. That is a tribal inheritance of a specific portion of land for themselves like the rest of the tribes, like Judah got tribal allotment. And this was in punishment 
to what their fathers had done, Simon and Levi. And this proves the point that I've been stressing here. Even though they kept saying this should not be done. And I know, I'm sorry guys, I also forgot the point that when they used the terminology for the first time, they saw themselves distinctively as a people. Such things should not be done in Israel. Such things should not be done in Israel. They saw themselves as a distinctive tribe. This still does not excuse the fact they went too far. You don't kill everybody and take everybody. This is not justice. As this incident is recorded in scripture for the Jewish people, this will serve to them as a reminder because notice they are going to come into the promised land after, remember, after there being 400 years in Egypt. They are going to come into the prom come back into the promised land and God will enact in the Mosaic covenant, the command do not intermarry with the Canaanites as the thing that I told you earlier. I think that's found somewhere like Deuteronomy chapter 20, if I'm correct, but do not interact, intermarry with these Canaanites, destroy their idol gods, destroy their idol places of worship and don't marry them. Because why? Ultimately, when you do so, they will turn your hearts from following the true and living God. And that's the whole point. Israel's distinctiveness in God's purpose to set them apart as a holy people, holy nation, preserve God's law, preserve God's worship, preserve the worship of God. But when you do these things, it will uh, dilute your purpose and not only your ethnicity, but mainly your purpose as well. Okay. So this incident will serve as a reminder for the Israelite people hundreds of years into the future. Do not intermarry with the Canaanites. Okay. Because once again, why the, 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 the influence of these Canaanites. And that's the reason why God wanted to maintain that distinctiveness of the Jewish people so that they would not be influenced by their immorality, their godlessness, their idolatry. Okay. But anyway, nevertheless, thanks for joining me on that one. But let me give you a little preview concerning the points that I was trying to make in that. As we get into chapter 35, we're going to see now Jacob. Remember, Jacob said, you have made me odious in the nostrils of the neighboring Canaanites. They're going to gather together and kill me. So what we are going to see in chapter 35 is God validating uh, Jacob's thoughts. And God is going to speak to Jacob and tell him to return to Bethel, to leave that place. And God himself is once again, is going to come to the rescue of Abraham's descendant. He's going to come to his rescue, give him divine protection. But we are going to see something else, something that Jacob is going to say to his clan that is proof positive of Dinah never having to, you never should have gone there in the first place was now introduced that, that we're now going to see as they were socializing with these Canaanites, how the Canaanites will have influenced Jacob, the people of God, how this influence will cause a problem. But anyway, I don't want to get into all of that. So you definitely want to join me in Genesis chapter 35. Anyway, so I won't get no further into all of that. See you next time.